Babies starving in a country on the brink of collapse. But just where is the international outrage? And how did Britain join those countries dropping bombs in Yemen? After almost a decade of war, it's children suffering most. Our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, reports from inside the country. Their lives are extraordinarily hard, and yet they're saying now it's even harder. Houthi rebels may be the enemies of the West, but in Yemen, more people are starting to see them as heroes because of their stance on the war in Gaza. We hear from one of the group's leaders. We have the weapon and we have the capabilities and we have the targets and we have also the cap capacities and we also have our own surprises. If they don't stop uh, the blockade against Gaza, as the group ramps up its attacks, now there's a looming environmental disaster in the Red Sea, threatening nature, food supplies and livelihoods. So what can be done to alleviate the suffering? We'll ask whether peace is possible anytime soon. Also on the program, the first live interview with Iranian journalist Puria Zirati. His stabbing in London less than a fortnight ago raised major security concerns amid fears it was a hit job ordered from Tehran. Plus, high alert at Champions League fixtures across Europe after a warning they could be targeted by ISIS-K terrorists. We've got the latest. That's all coming up on The World with me, Yalda Hekin. Good evening. Imagine being the poorest country on the planet and having the world's most powerful bomb you sporadically. That's precisely what Britain and the United States are doing to Yemen, a country already facing the worst humanitarian crisis and where UNICEF says a child dies every 10 minutes from malnutrition and preventable diseases. The bombing campaign by the West is directed at Houthi rebels who control the north and have been attacking shipping in the Red Sea. It's had a massive impact on the world's economy, costing companies billions. And for that reason, the likes of Britain and America say the Houthis must be stopped. But why, you might ask, are the Houthis doing this and how? Their main motivation, they say, is to see an end to the war in Gaza. Since November, they've attacked ships which pass through the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. It's won them more support in Yemen and regionally. Once hated, they're now seen by some people as heroes. Now, in a moment, our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, will join us live from the city of Aden. We'll ask why this is a crucial moment for the Houthis and why, despite the West's efforts, they could be in their strongest position yet to grab power. First, though, here's Alex's report on Yemen's humanitarian crisis, which includes images of unwell and malnourished children. Suffering doesn't hide itself in Yemen, and hunger hits the young most hard. Salah's too weak to drink anything. So the medic injects him with glucose. It's enough to revive him a little and gives him just enough energy to protest at the pain. His cries are seen as fragile progress. But it's tiny and slow, and it may not be enough to save him. Life is difficult, his mother says. They live hand to mouth selling goods on the street. She's not well fed and that impacts on the baby. In the next bed, there's another baby clinging to life. Like Salah next to him, Yasef too has severe acute malnutrition. In Yemen, the harsh reality is most babies, most people will go to sleep hungry each night. The two babies have been born in a country at war. That cut their survival odds. But it's the spillover from the Gaza war, which many here believe has slashed those odds even further. Costs have gone up and salaries down, the doctor says. Disruption to maritime trade has meant imports are more expensive. And Yemenis who are almost entirely reliant on aid have seen food prices soar. Now that crucial aid could dwindle further after America designated the Houthis a terrorist outfit because of their attacks on shipping routes. Certainly on the ground, this British charity told us life has got a lot harder for those who are already suffering. 
what the situation before was has now been exacerbated even more. Even more people are food insecure, even more people are water insecure. Um, and it's going to take more than um, you know, international INGOs to kind of plug the gaps of what's happening here. Nine years of civil war has already devastated Yemen and left millions living in miserable conditions for which there seems no end. The people are all suffering, this man tells us. They live from day to day, some begging, selling scrap or borrowing money. But it's very difficult. The level of poverty here is absolutely extreme. There's just shacks and bits of material, corrugated iron and wood just stacked up everywhere to make homes for these people. Their lives are extraordinarily hard. And yet they're saying now it's even harder. Almost half of Yemen's population has no access to clean water, and the spiraling conditions here since the Gaza bombings has led to more disease. Emergency tents have been erected in Aden to cope with a fresh outbreak of cholera. The patients have been coming in from all across Yemen, and that is worrying. And with the Muslim celebration of Eid at the end of Ramadan, the danger is it'll spread fast. The lack of money throughout the country and the deteriorating infrastructure means Yemen is at its least able to cope right now. We have divided country first. We have uh, these problems, inflation, we have uh, no war, we have another external war, not in Yemen only, but outside Yemen. All this effect on our life. And at the same time, in the, our health, the health of the population. And that's hit babies like Salah especially hard. Every day of his five months has been spent trying to survive the legacy of Yemen's war. He may not have the strength in him to fight the effects of another. And Alex joins me now live from the port city of Aden. Alex, thank you so much for all of that powerful reporting that you've done um, from inside Yemen. But, but frankly, as you say, this war has been grinding on. It's almost 10 years since it began. And images like uh, that of baby Salah are, are all too familiar. Uh, the images of, of a starving Yemen, it, it's something that we have continually seen over the last 10 years. It's gone on for a long, long time, and it seems probably twice as long if you're actually living in Yemen and a Yemeni. Nine years of bombings, airstrikes, landmines blowing up. The country is a patchwork of armed checkpoints, making trade and travel really difficult to do. It is terrible, and the suffering has just got worse because now they not only have to contend with a civil war in their own country, but they're now being dragged into another war, 2,000 kilometers, more than 2,000 kilometers away. So it is very difficult. And right now, if you're a Yemeni, you can't see any end in sight. No, uh, that's right. And I'm just curious to uh, get a sense from you. I mean, given their suffering, given, given everything that's been going on um, in, in Yemen, are they feeling as though what the Houthis are doing in, in terms of their stance where they're saying, well, we're, we're attacking shipping lanes in the Red Sea because of what's happening in Gaza, are they seeing that as, as sort of the right thing or are they saying, look, we've got enough problems ourselves? They have got a considerable amount of problems and they're living and dying through it every day. They historically support the Palestinians. There's no doubt about that. They uh, uh, live and breathe support of the, of the Gazans. I mean, as we spoke to fishermen just yesterday, they said, uh, why do we support Gaza? Because they have Arab blood. We have Arab blood. We are all together. We'll, if you don't defend Gaza as a Yemeni, you don't deserve to live. Their feelings for what's happening in Gaza are extremely strong and they shouldn't be underestimated. And these were people who are on the opposite divide to the Houthis. They're on the opposite side of the civil war. So they have, there is no love lost between them and the Houthis. The Houthis have got a lot of popularity as a result of declaring their stance and targeting uh, shipping routes and connecting it with what's happening in Gaza. There's no doubt about that. 
But that doesn't mean that the people in Yemen are suddenly all switching to the Houthis. There's a lot of distrust between the various different groups and there's a lot of ground to cover in trying to make this country work again uh, politically, economically and, and socially. Yeah, and Alex, as you say, we will in the programme have more from uh, those fishermen and, and those on the other side of, of this conflict um, uh, for more of your reporting. But for now, thank you so much. Well, as Alex mentioned in her report, the Iranian-backed armed rebel group, the Houthis, are central to the conflict in Yemen. They're part of the so-called axis of resistance alongside Hamas and Hezbollah against Israel and the West. The Houthis came into prominence during the early 2000s, where they fought a series of rebellions against Yemen's longtime authoritarian president, Ali Abdullah Saleh. During the 2011 Arab Spring, a popular uprising forced President Saleh to step down and hand over power to his deputy, Abd Rabu Mansour Hadi. The Houthis then took advantage of the political instability in 2014 and seized control of the northern province of Sada before taking the Yemeni capital, Sana'a. In February 2018, rebels seized large parts of western Yemen and forced President Hadi to flee abroad. A month later, the conflict escalated when a Saudi-led US and UK-backed military coalition began a bombing campaign against the Houthis. In June 2018, the Saudi-led coalition launched an offensive on the port city of Hodeidah, Yemen's main entry port for food and humanitarian aid. The US announced in February 2021 that it was ending its support for the Saudi-led coalition and called for a ceasefire in Yemen. Two years later, Iran and Saudi Arabia agreed to restore diplomatic ties, leading to renewed hope of peace talks between opposing sides in Yemen. Following Hamas's attack on Israel on October the 7th, the Houthis declared war on Israel and launched attacks on commercial and U.S. Navy ships in the Red Sea. In response, the U.S. began carrying out a series of strikes against multiple locations in Yemen, which are linked to the Houthis. Alex spoke to a senior Houthi leader and asked what good attacking vessels in the Red Sea would bring. The positive thing is that we stand by our brothers and their case who are now uh, suffering genocide. And uh, there's something in, in negative that we try, I mean, to stop the American and British uh, weapons to go to Israel because it's uh, an occupied, uh, occupying uh, army. Let's talk about what the weapons of Britain and America have done to the Palestinian people. They just only get sufferings and sufferings there. Let's ask why do you uh, insist to send weapons to Israeli uh, and also why do you send food to the people who uh, may have left, uh, who imposed a blockade against the Palestinian people? We try, I mean, to stop the uh, uh, Israeli offensive against the children of Gaza. And this is the normal thing and this is the positive thing we, uh, we have done and everybody should support us. We can talk about the uh, British no, supply so and the American and supply of weapons to, to uh, Israel uh, in a little bit, if you like. But I want to talk about the Houthi actions first, because it doesn't seem to have had anything other than a detrimental effect, particularly against Yemenis, because the, it has affected the price of everything, including food. And now your own citizens, your own civilians are suffering, as well as a number of other civilians in poorer countries. Yes, uh, the American statements, they are talking about the care about the Yemeni people and they have imposed a blockade against the Yemeni people for nine years. They have never talked about uh, the sufferings that we have been suffering here. And they, they stopped uh, two thirds of the aid for the Yemen, uh, Yemen because Trump said that. I think right now the US are saying and the UN are saying that the Houthi attacks on shipping is having a massive detrimental effect not just on Yemeni civilians because it's cut humanitarian aid but it's also possibly hindering any progress for peace and sorting out all the problems in Yemen finally which we were edging towards. It's a chance to have a peace for our brothers and Palestinians. Uh, and this is the only possible way for the Republic of Yemen to help. 
because our attacks came to support our brothers in back in uh, Palestine. If they stop their ag aggression, we will stop too. So if there was a ceasefire tomorrow in between Gaza and Israel, or Israel agreed to, to a ceasefire and stopped the bombardment, the hostages being held by Hamas were released, you would suspend all your operations along the shipping routes? Oh, if that is. Sure. OK, and how would you then progress peace? Because that's what people in Yemen are crying out for, peace. Uh, the, the Yemenis, they know that who, uh, have, who has bombarded them for a long period, whether it's Britain or America or Saudi or, uh, Emirates, they are not going to come to us to offer peace uh, on a silver, a silver plate. But Yemenis yeah, themselves, they can make peace, and we can make the peace. Uh, my message to them, uh, which is true and honest to all the parts that uh, gather against us, that the Republic of Yemen is not the same uh, Republic of Yemen in 2015. Now we have the weapon, and we have the capabilities, and we have the targets, and we have also the cap capacities, and we also have our own surprises. If they don't stop uh, the blockade against Gaza, and also stop the genocide against Gaza. Mr. Al Houthi, I know we've got a very short time with you, so thank you for, for spending that time and explaining a few things. And I hope you, you, you also lift the blockade against uh, British journalists like myself so that we can, we can come and report events in the north of Yemen. And Alex uh, joins us again uh, from Aden in Yemen. Um, you know, Alex, what was extraordinary about listening to that interview was just how emboldened, how confident that Houthi leader <laughs> sounded. I mean, they're up against a US-led coalition, which is comprising of about 20 of the world's most powerful countries, and yet they've still managed to almost run, run rings around the United States and Britain. Yeah, and I was, I have interviewed Mohammed Al Houthi a number of times before. I spent some time with him and his fighters in the north, and his demeanor in this recent interview was quite, quite different to the way it's been in the past. Before he appeared angry, uh, disillusioned, uh, sometimes frustrated, and was uh, very determined to try and get um, on the media, especially the Western media, to, to talk about the Houthis and what was happening, particularly the British bombing in Yemen. This was before October the 7th. This time, he was all smiles. He was relaxed. He was keen to, to, to talk, very uh, anxious to um, talk about, uh, you know, how basically how they were and have got the international community, particularly America and Britain, over a barrel right now. Their, their uh, military action hitting Houthi bases in the north of Yemen have patently failed because the Houthis are not only continuing their attacks and, and wreaking havoc on the international shipping routes, but they're extending it to the Indian Ocean in the, just in the last few days. And they're showing no signs of any compromise. And the Houthis today, compared to pre-October the 7th, are in a much stronger negotiating position uh, as far as peace talks and the roadmap to peace here in Yemen. A year ago when we were here at the time that Iran and Saudi Arabia, the two regional powers who have been accused of uh, mounting a proxy war and using Yemen as their battlefield, agreed to talks, agreed to try and uh, address the problem and come together and, and try and uh, force through or agree some sort of roadmap to peace. That has faltered and stuttered since October the 7th, and now the Houthis are in a much stronger bargaining position, and there's unfortunately no doubt about that, and they're going to use it, I thought, taking uh, the, the messages from that interview. Yeah, I mean, uh, quite extraordinary, uh, as you say, that this has also been an, a, a, an incredible PR campaign for the Houthis, that they have been able to lure some of the most powerful nations on the planet to them uh, as they launch their, their campaign, they say, in, in support of, of Gaza. And, and we heard there in your interview where he said he will, they will stop these attacks on the shipping lanes uh, if there is a ceasefire in Gaza. Um, fantastic reporting, as always, from you, Alex. And, and we will be coming back to you uh, a little later in the programme. Thank you so much for now.
Don't go anywhere. We've got lots more coming up of Alex's special reporting out of Yemen. Uh, she's looking at, uh, as she's been saying, uh, the impact uh, on uh, the environment uh, because of these attacks on the uh, shipping lanes and, and the environmental disaster that this has uh, caused. Do stay with us to find out exactly what that impact is and what the, farm, uh, the, the fishermen uh, in Yemen think about it. Stay with us. songs to be famous. I write songs because I've got to make something good out of something bad. I liked this film. I think there's been a lot of inf misinformation about it online. A lot of people thought it was going to be disrespectful to her and kind of dwell on the drugs. But actually, it's a quite a positive, lovely first-person story in a way. It's told from her point of view. The director wanted to show things from her perspective when, when she met Blake, when she fell for this man who would be very difficult for her. They had a terrible, tumultuous relationship, as we know. Need to know yes. um, but here, played by right. Marisa Abella and Jack O'Connell, um, it's a rather touching oh, story gosh. about romantic obsession and then an obsession which then, of course, led to the writing of one of the best-selling albums of all time, mm -hmm. Back to Black. There's one thing, like, learning the mannerisms and learning of what it is that she does with her body, but there's another thing, like, inhabiting those to the point where it feels completely natural. So, like, if someone says something that I don't like, like, I move in a certain way that she would move. And if I'm super excited about something, then I'm excited in the way that she would express that, you know, because there's one thing about being present in a moment as an actor, and then there's another about being present in the moment as an actor and also layering things on top. So it was just doing enough work in the preparation process that I wasn't thinking about these things on set that I could just, you know, be with the other people and enjoy it. I think at first, obviously, it takes some adjustment because nobody can be Amy Winehouse. Obviously, she does a very good job singing, but nobody can sing exactly like Amy Winehouse. But she approximates it well enough. And after a while, I think, because of the strong filmmaking, you relax into it and, and you kind of believe it. And, I, I yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Welcome back. We're staying with the situation in Yemen. As the country grapples with war and unprecedented levels of hunger, there are concerns attacks by the Houthis in the Red Sea have unleashed a looming environmental disaster. Our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, has been out in the Gulf of Aden. They set out every morning with high hopes. But Yemen's fishing industry is struggling badly. A long civil war has already made sea life tough. Now there's added danger. The waters they rely on have turned into a war zone. The battlefield that's Gaza is being fought on the seas here, and it's hurting them badly. This war's affecting our work 100%, Naeem tells us. 
He says they're forced to fish near the coast, or they run into the Iranian or U.S. navies who stop them. So their haul is small. They'll only make about a dollar each from all this, but they're still fiercely in support of defending the Palestinians. They're killing children and women, he goes on about the Israeli bombardment. It's not an army fighting an army. Yet they're no fans of the Houthi militants who are targeting international cargo ships in their fishing waters. These men are on the opposite side of Yemen's civil war to them. But the Houthi stand against the Israeli aggression has won them respect in places they never expected. This building is too old, OK? In Yemen's rundown laboratories, though, they're fighting another battle, stopping an environmental disaster they fear is waiting to happen. Mm. This is the samples what I get from Rebunar. They've got they Red Sea here. water samples from near a cargo ship hit by the Houthis and now posing a pollution threat. Mm. But there are problems. OK, it's not enough to run the, some, the testing, OK? So the damaged ship has a cargo of hazardous chemicals, so they're frantically testing the few samples to see if any has already polluted the Red Sea. If the ship's containers break up, the pollution will be a catastrophe, and Yemen has few facilities to cope with that. With no support, really, the Yemeni people will suffering alone, and not just the Yemeni, also our neighbors. It's not like just in Yemeni, no, this is spreading, so it will not affect just the Yemen. The Ruby Mar is the cargo ship causing major concern. It was hit by Houthi missiles in mid-February, and an oil slick was spotted soon after. It began sinking almost immediately, along with its dangerous cargo. A report seen by Sky News has been sent to the United Nations, calling for urgent help to protect the Red Sea coastline. At risk, not only the fishing community, but ecologically sensitive and precious marine life, which could be damaged forever. The leaking could happen any time, today or tomorrow. It's very urgent, because if it happens, it will affect the whole Red Sea, the mangrove trees, the marine life and the Red Sea coast. Imagine how many fishermen rely on the sea every day, and this will affect the whole fishing community. The commander of the Yemeni Navy reassures us there's no need for the armed men escorting us all. But he also knows he has a nigh impossible task keeping Yemen's seas safe. The navy, like so much in Yemen, has been left on its knees by the country's internal fighting. The debris from bombs and neglect is everywhere. So you can see all around there's broken boats. Not much has happened here since, since the war began in 2015. A lot of debris all around. The admiral is anxious to show us the few resources he has. His job involves not only securing Yemeni territorial waters, but also the critical Bab al-Mandeb Strait for the international shipping trade. His crews are up against pirates, smugglers, and now Houthi militant strikes. But the biggest threat, he says, is from the Houthis. An international task force is helping, but the Yemenis feel very much alone. We're morally responsible for protecting our territorial waters, but at the moment, we don't have the means to protect against piracy, terrorism, smuggling, and the Houthi intrusion. If we don't get support to help us confront the Houthis, then the opposite will be the case. And the opposite of security is chaos in the seas. That's terrorism, piracy, and disruption. Fishing and the sea is the lifeblood of many Yemenis, but it's become an increasingly risky business. You're always scared, Awad says, because you just don't know when you'll be attacked. In a country already split by war and left devastated by it, yet more insecurity and possible pollution of its most precious resource is a frightening prospect for Yemenis. And Alex joins us uh, again live from the port city of Aden. And um, Alex, uh, I mean, we were talking a little earlier there about how emboldened, how confident the, the Houthis currently feel, especially because they feel that many Yemenis support their current cause. Um, however, we just heard there from the other side, the, the, the fishermen who really are feeling the impact of this and are, are on the front line of, of the Houthi attacks at the moment. 
I mean, they are torn. They're clearly conflicted because they definitely feel the need to support the Palestinians. They, they're bought, brought up like that and they feel that they're, the Gazans, as they say, are in their blood. They're part of them. They, they're, they feel very similar to them and they're also poor and feel oppressed. That same fisherman said, we're oppressed by the Houthis too. So they are conflicted because the Houthi attacks have definitely led to a surge in popularity for the Houthis, not just in the north, not just in Yemen, but across the world. But it is having a real dramatic impact, not, not just here in Yemen, particularly hitting the fishermen. It's uh, the fear of pollution from those, uh, that ship that's, that's been down and the possibility of chemical fertilizer in the water has, has really already impacted with people worried about eating the fish. And it's, it's hit their economy, really hit it hard. Yeah, and, and Alex, the other interesting thing for me that, that really stuck out from that report just, just now was, was the Admiral and the fact that they are so weak uh, up against a, a very strong and, and relentless enemy. Yeah, and they've got a lot of challenges. So even before uh, the attacks on the international shipping trade, they had to contend with smugglers. They've uh, got a history of, of fighting uh, terrorists in, in this, this area. And now they've got Houthi missile attacks. And he said the biggest threat was from the Houthis. This is a country torn apart by war, and it's still torn apart by war, with the UN Special Envoy for Yemen saying that this has to be sorted soon. It can't be sorted militarily. That was just a few days ago. That seems to be an admission from some of the most powerful countries in the world that bombing here in Yemen is not going to lead to any positive action. People on the ground in Yemen are suffering. They're dying uh, on a daily basis. Uh, they, they need to have peace, and one, but that's not going to happen until the issues in Gaza are sorted because the Houthi militants are going to carry on their attacks and they show no sign of stopping right now. Alex, uh, we're really grateful uh, for all of your reporting. As we said, it's quite rare to have journalists inside Yemen. So for you to um, draw attention to the current situation there from uh, the famine and the starvation to the environmental impact in that interview with the Houthis, uh, thank you so much for all of that. Well, with me in the studio tonight, a former Minister of State for the Middle East, Alistair Burt, and Faria al-Muslimi, writer and research fellow at Chatham House's Middle East and North Africa program. Thank you both uh, for joining us here on the program. I, I mean, Alistair, I'll begin with you because you've been watching Yemen for, for a very long time and, and the challenges are, are vast. We can see it there and it doesn't feel like it's ending anytime soon. And as Alex was saying, bombing Yemen isn't, doesn't feel like it's, it's the solution. They've been doing it for so long. Hmm. And firstly, all credit to Alex Crawford for yet another extraordinary report and for making sure that we remember what the UN has said is the world's largest humanitarian crisis, which is Yemen, as you say, going on for a long time. I'm not sure that characterising it as bombing Yemen is quite appropriate. What the UK and the US are doing at present is seeking to prevent the actions which have just been described by the fishermen as doing them so much harm. Uh, that is stopping the Houthi attacking vessels in the working, Red Sea. Though, is it, Alistair? It, my understanding it is reducing the capability. It's reducing the capability, reducing the number of attacks. But of course, we're in an asymmetric situation in which if one rocket gets through, people are saying the Houthi are winning. But the Houthi aren't winning. Um, no one in Gaza is benefiting from what they're doing. No one in Yemen is benefiting from what they're doing. Their environmental risk is high. The lives of those who carry the shipping are put at risk. Those who depend on those ships for grain, whether it's in Lebanon or in Yemen or anywhere else, are, are being affected. What do people expect the international community to do to allow this to go on with all those risks or to seek to take action against those who are attacking the but, ships? But, Freya, do you feel, you know, that, that whatever these targeted strikes are, is it working? I mean, we just had that interview there with the Houthi leader. He seemed more confident than ever. I mean, we have seen a tendency since 2002, started with the United States for different countries, to, to take different uh, routes bombing Yemen and different groups and thinking this will make a tremendous difference. It didn't really make with Al-Qaeda, it didn't make with the Saudis and the UAE for nine years, and I don't think this will make a tremendous difference at the moment. 
And this is for many reasons. Also because we don't know how to define winning with the Houthis. This is a thug-style mafia that doesn't care really if it interrupts international norms, if it interrupts the trades, if uh, it holds millions of people hostages. It's a different way of a matter of a calculation. So, yes, in a way, the minute you go to a war with them, they win, in my opinion. Anyways, that's already the game and that they have. And this is not to romanticize the Houthis. These are a dangerous organization that terrorize the, the Yemeni people as much as they are currently the, the world economy. Yeah, yeah, there is, I mean, uh, of course, like any um, uh, radical group that is controlling its society by armed, it's very easy to have uh, control over the society, to big, make big protests. But in Yemen, there is less support for the Houthis than there is at the Labour Party in the UK. You know, not most of Yemen is fantasized in any way. It is, unfortunately, I believe, this is a leftist phenomenon anyway. It's not in Yemen to have a fantasies about groups like the Houthis and Hezbollah sometimes. But it's a, a quite, in, in Yemen, it's not a popular group, and this didn't make it more or less but popular. But that's not how uh, the Houthis are now spinning this, even the bombing campaign. Um, they're spinning this as, you look at us, we're, we're the heroes in all of this, and it will, it'll stop. If, if the ceasefire takes place in, in Gaza, do you actually believe that they'll stop this? Because this is benefiting. Two things. Uh, the conflict, the, the civil war in Yemen went on for nine years before uh, the recent conflict in Gaza even started. That's nine years for those who were fighting Yemen to come to their own agreement, to stop the fighting, to build up the economy, to support the people and avoid this terror uh, group running the country, which Ferreira has, has spoken of. So they have that opportunity. Gaza has, without doubt, you and Alex are absolutely right, it has given the Houthi a platform, an opportunity to parade on the world stage, which they didn't otherwise have. And there is also no doubt that because of the feeling throughout the Arab world about what is happening in Gaza, any who take the side of uh, the Palestinians who are under pressure in Gaza get massive support. It all adds to the sense that uh, the conflict in Gaza must come to an end, the hostages released, aid goes in, Gaza should end, it will have beneficial effects. My understanding is that there is some belief that if it does come to an end, there is no reason why the Houthi uh, attacks on the Red Sea should continue. But the conflict in Gaza is separate to what's happening in Yemen. It should end in any case, but equally, those in Yemen should continue the UN-led peace process, make sure the current ceasefire that is in place lasts and begin to build a Yemen that its people deserve, not the humanitarian crisis are, that we've seen tonight. Are you optimistic that that can happen? Hmm. I, I suppose when you've worked in the Middle East for many years, you, you have to be a professional optimist because so many things sort of knock you off course. There are good people everywhere working for peace, whether it's the agencies, whether it's those politicians in different groups who want to see something different for their people as they deserve. History, in fact, would tend to make you more pessimistic. But you've got to believe there is an opportunity and hope. I think the UN peace process, I think Hans Grunberg has done a good job, supported by good people in Yemen. They have got to lead this. They have got to decide their own future. And we, like the British government, are doing, and our, our colleagues in, in, uh, uh, in, in the embassy and those who are working in Yemen are trying to support that process. Bria, I've got 30 seconds. Are you hopeful? You have no choice except to be hopeful. That's the only currency for any person who's trying to make a difference. But overall, I think Yemen, contrary to Libya, to Syria, to Iraq, to even Lebanon, have a, a chance and have an opportunity. We're, we have a history of uh, conflict and we have a history of conflict resolution. This was the first democracy in the Arabian Peninsula. This is a country that has gone through Marxism, Republicanism, Arab Spring, all sorts of movement through history. So definitely, I am still optimist around it. Yes, we have to start from Gaza and then we can address the other two aspects in Yemen. But I have no doubt also that if the Gaza war stops, the Houthis actually will stop at the Red Sea. The question is, how do you allow that to happen without rewarding them? Because that will look that like will rewarding. Look like a, it's, it, it, they were it, able to manage yeah. the, the, the twist the West are more than Putin. Yeah. It's a quite a scary in a way. So how do you strike that balance, balance. is a quite important. And I think the optics matter more than yeah. we think. Uh, Faria. Alistair, thank you both uh, for joining us and for all of your analysis. Don't go anywhere. We've got lots more coming up on The World uh, with me, Yalda Hakim. We'll be speaking to uh, the Iranian journalist who was attacked uh, outside of his home. He was stabbed. He says uh, he could have been killed, but it was a warning shot. And we understand that three of the attackers have left the country. Uh, stay with us for his first live interview.
Welcome back to the program. Next, we're going to talk about Puriya Zirati. The Iranian journalist was attacked outside his home in London at the end of last month. It's a stark reminder of the danger facing many Iranians who choose to criticize the regime in Tehran. Well, uh, Puriya joins me now live. Thank you so much, Puriya, for, for joining us here on the program. I just want to begin by asking you how, how you are um, just uh, under a fortnight since that attack when you were stabbed. Uh, thank you, Yalda, for having me. It's a pleasure to be in your show. And uh, I'm feeling much better physically, uh, recovering, uh, taking still antibiotics and painkillers, of course. Uh, but mentally, definitely, it takes some time to get over it. But we're all trying with my family and friends by video calls and my wife with me in a safe house. Uh, so we are moving forward. And as they say in English, the show must go on. Yeah, I mean, you're incredibly courageous and brave because just a week <coughs> after you were attacked, you went back to the studio, uh, back to presenting, back to doing your, your show, despite concerns that this attack happened as a result of what you do for a living. But just take me back to that evening and, and what exactly happened. Uh, yes, on Friday 29th of March afternoon, around... Um, quarter to 3 p.m. Uh, I was going towards my car, uh, actually to go to studio to have my show, uh, which is every Friday uh, um, at, at 5.30 p.m. UK time. Uh, I was approached by a man uh, who was pretending to be asking for three pounds cash. And uh, I was saying, as I was saying that I don't have any change, the second man approached and they just grabbed me from the front uh, very firmly. And the first person uh, who asked for three pounds cash, she stabbed me in my leg, in my back side of the leg, in my thighs. And they very fast they ran away. And first, actually, I was thinking it's a robbery, but I saw my mobile phones, my watch, my uh, wallet with uh, cash in it, and uh, my AirPod are with me. So suddenly, I just noticed there's something regarding my job, considering the ongoing threats we've been facing since uh, a couple of years ago, uh, 22 uprisings in Iran. Uh, and then the police arrived, and then the ambulance. Uh, I want to thank the uh, medical team in ambulance and then the hospital because I lost a lot of blood and they helped me a lot in first uh, hours. Uh, yeah, that's what happened on Friday. Well, uh, as I said, a week later, you went back to work and Scotland Yard is investigating this. You also uh, now have security and protection uh, around you. Um, and they are looking into the fact that this could be state-sponsored uh, terrorism and, and an attack uh, targeting you. How do you feel now? Uh, you know, this is obviously something <coughs> that you, you were hit on your leg. Uh, do you think they, they could have killed you, though? Yes. First, uh, I need to talk about the facts uh, um, and, and, and what happened and what is happening in terms of investigation. Uh, as uh, per la latest police as a statement, uh, Metropolitan Police and specifically the Counterterrorism Unit, they are still investigating the case. And uh, as you mentioned in the opening, um, three suspects uh, have fled the country and uh, they are working constantly with their international partners um, to, to bring them back to the UK. Uh, this is uh, what I can share right now and uh, at this stage. But the fact that counterterrorism police, specifically SO15 unit, which deals with hostile states uh, in the UK, are leading this investigation and, and, and inspections, uh, that says it all. Uh, so for now, um, it it looks like a state-sponsored attack, uh, and but but we need to wait for for more investigation results to come out, and and it will be published by the police. Uh, in terms of uh, the 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 risk against me, uh, the scenario uh, I think was to harm me because the way they were holding me on that on that afternoon, uh, Friday, 29th of March. And then they stab me in my leg. Uh, they could they could stab anywhere in my body uh, as they were running away. So they could make sure that I'm not alive after they run away. So they could stab in my neck. They could stab in my heart. Uh, there are places specifically that people make sure um, you know the target is dead. Uh, so that's my assumption. Um, you know that's not something we can be sure about. As I said, the investigation is still going on, and we need to wait and see what was the. Uh, exact motive and and target um, on that day, but this is my this is my kind of guess. For yeah, now. I, 
I mean, are you now worried about about your safety and, and security and getting around? Uh, Yalda, yeah, we need to clarify. It's a, there is a difference between uh, being worried and uh, being um, scared. You know, of course, I am worried and I'm concerned and uh, we are under protection right now and uh, I'm not even allowed to visit uh, my friends. And uh, so that is that is concerning. This, the whole situation is concerning. But if it was done to scare me and, and to silence me, definitely it's not working. Uh, because uh, I need to again clarify, this was an attack against me as Puria. This was an attack against the job I do. This was a, this was an attack against the platform I have, uh, which, uh, based on latest surveys in Iran, via satellite, people watching well, millions of people watch it every week. Every week, uh, the whole network actually. So, uh, yeah, there is a difference. I am concerned, but I am not scared. And that's led you to return to work, uh, to go back to the studio. Uh, as I said, just seven days after the following week, you went back to your show, back to the same studio, probably back yeah. to the same car park where it happened. Yeah, actually, I was staying in the hospital. Uh, after I was discharged, I was moved to a safe house, and then, uh, which is actually still ongoing. Uh, but uh, yeah, the fact that uh, I insisted in getting back to work, which caused a lot of problem uh, for the for the security team of the television network, Iran International, and also the police actually helped me uh, to and from st studio, I mean, arranging the transport and stuff. But actually, I wanted to go to studio and have my show last Friday uh, to send a message back to whoever did that and whatever the motive was that the show is still going on. I, I am here. And uh, my audience are still watching this show. And, and as I said, the flow of the information cannot be stopped in 21st century. But, Puri, you say this is uh, an attack uh, against the, the network, against uh, your show, against what you, what you do. Do you have a sense of why it might have been specifically you uh, that was targeted? Uh, um as you know, um, and, and probably to give you a background story, the threats have been ongoing against the network since the uprising started in 2022. We had the news in December 22, discovered by uh, ITV News, which they had an exclusive report about two of my colleagues, uh, um, which the plot against them, assassination plot against them, was, was foiled by the British intelligence service. So if we consider these facts and also the whole uh, attack against the headquarter building in Chiswick, which we had to shut down the studios for a while in London. We moved to Washington, D.C. for a period of about nine months uh, to reestablish the headquarter in another area in London and in a, in a safer place. And so considering these facts, this is not the first time happening to journalists working uh, in Iran International. This organization news organization was designated as a terrorist organization by the Iranian regime uh, during the uprisings in Iran. And, and, and uh, Puri, I, I just want to know, I mean, as a network, were you uh, taking extra precautions given um, the the threats against um, the network and given, you know, as course. you say, it was, it was, um, it, please go on. Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, as as I said, we have been facing the threats uh, constantly, especially, you know, I've been in this job for 14 years. I used to work for another network and then I joined the Iran International. The threats have been there always, but uh, specifically after September 2022, um, which uh, they actually killed Mahsa Amini because of compulsory will in Iran and the following uh, the uprising. And then uh, again, uh, uh, you know, uh, after the October 7th attack on Israel, uh, you know, the Iranian regime uh, has leveled up the threats against journalists, activists, uh, you, you know, you know, dissidents, all the opposition groups. So this is not something new. We have been facing the threats uh, as network. I have been facing uh, threats from the regime personally. Uh, we've been always reporting them to the counterterrorism unit, and they are in constant contact with the network uh, security department. And uh, you know, in terms of arranging uh, all the measures they need to take to 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 make sure we are safe. But uh, you know, they and and there was a report. I think uh, a few days back, I read somewhere there was at least fifteen plots. 
uh, against Iranian journalists and activists in London since the beginning of 2022, which was did you think though the that British they would actually do? Did, did you think that they would actually be successful in this way? Uh, um, what do you mean by that? You mean by well, doing in, this? In, in the sense that, that the threats were there, you know, there's there's an understanding that there were, as you say, um, uh, there were allegedly 15 uh, plots that, that were, were foiled. But did you think that this would ever happen to you, uh, you know, given, given the, the threats? Uh, did you talk about this with your colleagues, with your family, that, you know, perhaps someday something like this could happen? Because it did, yes. it did shock the entire... Iranian diaspora and community, not just in this country, but right around the world? Yes, uh, this is something, you know, uh, being a journalist, uh, let me be clear, actually, Yaldo, and uh, I know uh, you have an Afghan background as well, and you know the, you know the region maybe more than the other journalists uh, who, who haven't been there. And uh, being a journalist in countries like Iran, Afghanistan, the whole Middle East uh, is totally different than being a journalist in a democratic country. So uh, it's a choice you make. So when you are in this job, uh, that's the choice you've made and you expect threats and, you know, incidents happening to you all the time. Or either you are a journalist on the field covering the war, covering the conflicts, covering the, you know, old terrorist attacks and stuff since uh, 20, 25 years ago specifically. And then uh, also living in, in, in European countries or, or, or North America, again, broadcasting for Iran and Middle East. So you are at risk. And this is not something that you don't expect and you will be completely shocked when it happens to you. But uh, I, need to be, uh, I, I need to be frank uh, when it happened to me. And specifically by the time the, the third uh, police statement came out, which was shared with me a few minutes before actually they, they published it, saying this was designed actually only to attack me. Uh, you know, they just had it planned to take a car. Just They just left the car abandoned about four miles from my house. And then they just left the country through Heathrow Airport. So this told me something. You know, this was shocking for me uh, for the beginning. And then uh, by the time it passes by, I, I just think, OK, so this was something I was expecting and it happened to me. But the fact and importance is it shouldn't stop me which is not, because as I said, it is against the narrative, it is against the stories I cover, it is against the show, it is against the network, and it is against the people who are watching. You know, they need to understand the fact that majority of people right now are watching satellite TVs and following news through social media through, and independent and, agencies and, and, and the, journalists. That is telling. Yeah, well, uh, Puria, you're incredibly uh, brave uh, and courageous, especially to return uh, back to work. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Yalda. Well, that's it for tonight's programme. Good night for now.